name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, amen. The cross is so many things to us, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a sign, it's an image that is known and seen all over the world. Uh, it's um, a, truly a sign of hope, of forgiveness. Uh, it is in the crucified Christ, our source of salvation, um, of mercy, of love, outstretched with his arms, gathering all people to us. This, this time of year is really a special time of year. Um, not just in, in our church, but uh, in the religious world. And uh, I know many of our kids who are in school, they were uh, off uh, last week. They had some, you know, uh, stuff going on in school with Rosh Hashanah. And tomorrow, my kids at least are off for Yom Kippur. And uh, so I started looking, I was like thinking every year, every year, Yom Kippur and the Feast of the Cross are at the same time. Why? Why is that? And, um, and so I, I began like doing some digging and some research on this. Uh, and it, it, it sort of kind of makes sense if you think about it. Because the largest Jewish population outside of Jerusalem in the first centuries of Christianity at least was in the city of Alexandria, Alexandria, which is where our Coptic rite developed out of, right? In Alexandria. So this time of year, it's a special time, uh, not only for us, but for the Jewish uh, community as well. And I just want to talk about some connections and some distinctions, connections and differences, okay? Uh, For the Copts, we celebrate the new year on the 1st of Tut, which is September the 11th. Yes, we can claim, claim September 11th before 2001. Um, and yet it was always a, like a, a celebration that pointed to uh, something that we remember with some sacrifice, some pain, uh, some giving of life. And that was the intention of the Coptic New Year when it started or when it was established from 284 AD. And then, of course, the 17th of two, which is this day in the Coptic year. Uh, we have the Feast of the Cross. In, in Judaism, uh, the, 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 the new year, Rosh Hashan or Rosh Hashanah, right? It's the, the new year. That's a time where the Jewish people celebrate creation. And they remember, they read the creation accounts. And then for the next eight days, it's a time of repentance for them. Leading up to Yom Kippur, which is quite possibly one of, if not the holiest day of the year, in Judaism. What's really interesting to me about the Coptic calendar and the Jewish calendar is they are completely distinct from the secular calendar where we celebrate, like most everyone else in the rest of the world, they celebrate the new year and the events coming after it, coming up in January 1st, okay? Except for the Chinese New Year, but... I'm going to put that in a separate category for maybe a discussion for another time. But what's, what's really interesting about those two calendars, both the Coptic and the Jewish calendar, is that they revolve not around secular events, but they revolve around their belief in God. It's a religious calendar. And the reason that's important is what they are implicitly, and what we are, I should say we are implicitly saying is the entirety of our life revolves around God. And the secular takes meaning and purpose from the spiritual. Okay? So when we have this distinct calendar, it's a reminder for us that our life doesn't revolve around the world in the, in the, the biblical sense of the word, but rather our lives in Christ give meaning and purpose in the world when it's centered in, in Christ and when it finds its origin in God. So let me come to Yom Kippur real quick. Yom Kippur is the, the day of atonement for some people who have a difficult time. I, I kind of uh, jokingly say Yom Kippur is like Yom Kabir, it's the big day. It's not literally Yom Kabir, but it, that's the way I remember. It's the big day, it's the, the day of atonement. It's the day the Jewish people come and they say this is the one day of the year they come and confess their sins 
And they are saying, we receive forgiveness and mercy on this day. This is the holiest day of the year. There are five sacrifices that take place. One of the, the big ones for that day is the, um, what they refer to as the scapegoat. There's a, a sacrifice made or prayers made on the scapegoat. It's sent out into the wilderness. But one of the sacrifices, the hand of the priest is laying on the animal sacrifice. As the people confess, it's as if he's displacing all of those sins upon that sacrifice before it is offered up as a sacrifice to God. On this day of atonement, the main themes are repentance and forgiveness. And if you ask Jewish people, they will say they don't feel any closer to God than on that day. Atonement means, in the Jewish understanding, it's the process of causing a transgression to be forgiven. It's being cleansed. In the Orthodox Christian sense of the word, the way we understand it, is that it's the time where we become at one. It's reconciliation with God. It's not just a cleansing, a wiping, it's we are being reconciled as well. And that reconciliation happens for us in the crucified Christ, who when he was crucified, the veil in the temple was torn, it was opened, and now we are reconciled back with the Father in Christ who allowed himself to be that veil that was torn on the cross. Okay, Leviticus 16 talks quite a bit about various feasts, and one of them is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Verse 29 and verse 30, verse 29 tells us, tells the Jewish people that they should afflict their souls and do no work at all. This is a day where Jews will spend the entire day there fasting. Orthodox Jews will spend the entire day, they won't eat a thing from sundown tonight until sundown tomorrow night when the Yom Kippur concludes. The following verse, verse 30, says, For on that day the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. And it's at Yom Kippur that there is either public or private acts of confession that are made. And as a result of that confession, the people believe they receive forgiveness as that sacrifice and that prayer is offered on their behalf. Just as a kind of like uh, anecdotal thing, this is where this practice of early Christian confession, public confession, because confession was done both publicly and privately, that's where that comes from. Public confession was uh, done away with in later centuries for, for various reasons. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, though, people ask, well, so why don't we celebrate the Day of Atonement now? So Hebrews 10, the author says, the law is only a shadow. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the reality themselves. The way we understand the Day of Atonement or Passover or any of these other Jewish feasts, they are a shadow pointing to something that is greater. And that greater reality is Christ himself, the incarnate word God in the flesh. And these things were there to prepare us for the reality, the truth of what was or who was to come. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, St. Paul says the following, for indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Okay? So just as Passover is a shadow and Christ is the Passover lamb, that Christ is also the atoner. He is our atonement. Why? Because remember, we believe that he is our forgiveness. He's our salvation. We also believe that it's in him that we have been reconciled with God through the union of the divine nature with the human nature. There's this reconciliation that's taken place. There's, in a true sense of their word, there's at one mint, 
in Christ. That's how we understand atonement in the Orthodox Christian sense. There is now an at one ment that is taking place. There's a union now with Christ, God who came and walked amongst us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, right? Because the old leaven is the shadow, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. We believe that the cross is the altar on which the Son was sacrificed. The Son offered himself for our forgiveness. The sacrifice whose aroma the Father accepted on behalf of humanity. The sins of humanity have been forgiven through the sacrifice of the cross, of Christ on the cross. So we celebrate today the power of the cross. And so that's why throughout the entire feast, we kept saying, hail to you, the cross, or hail to the cross, right? It's a greeting of honor to the cross. And the cross is not void of a person. It's not just two pieces of wood. It's what we're looking to as Christ on the cross. As we heard, reigning on his throne, the place of victory, the place of hope, the place of redemption. It's at that place that love was incarnate and that love stretched out his arms to save us, to forgive us, to heal us, and to purify us. I want to wrap up with three practical ways we can respond to the cross based on the Feast of the Cross. Number one is that we seek out the cross for our lives. We seek out the cross for our lives. There are two times a year we celebrate the Feast of the Cross. Today, today, tomorrow, and Tuesday. It's a three-day feast. And then another time during the month of the Coptic month of Paramhat, which is in the month of March, I believe. It's the 10th of Paramhat. And at that time, what we remember is one of the emperors in the 7th century by the name of Heraclius, or Hercules, if you like, who heard that the cross had been stolen and hidden, and he sought it out. He went to Constantinople because he wanted to search it out and find it. Okay? It's at that time that the church celebrates the appearance, but that appearance comes through a seeking of the cross. St. Paul says beautifully in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, I determine not to know anything except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Number one is we seek out the cross in our life. We seek him out by saying, I know nothing else except for Jesus Christ and him crucified. Yes, and in crucified, we already see the shadow of the victory of the resurrection as we heard. Number two is we discover the power of the cross in our lives. This feast day Queen Helen also sought out the cross, but one tradition says that when she entered into Jerusalem and she finally got to the place where the crosses were uh, were, were buried under dirt, she uncovered it and there were three crosses there, the the three crosses. And it was at that point that they were trying to figure out which of the three crosses was the cross of Christ. And so they brought a person who had departed, who had died, and put him on the first one and nothing happened. The second one, nothing happened. The third one, and he rose from the dead. This is a story in in, 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 uh, early Christian tradition. And so what what I want to offer to you is that it's not just a cross because it has two pieces of wood. No, no, there are, the cross was a weapon that was used by the Romans for many years to kill people. But the cross of Christ has a power of life in it. And so we don't just want to seek out with our eyes, but we want to discover the power of the cross in our own life as well. St. Paul says in that same chapter, or in that same book, rather, the previous chapter, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it's the power of God. The cross is the power of 
of God to those who are being saved. St. John Chrysostom commenting on this passage, he says, the power of the cross is not recognized by those who are perishing because they are out of their minds and act like madmen, complaining and rejecting the medicines which bring salvation. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, St. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We discover the power of the cross when we allow ourselves to be crucified with Christ. Then his life becomes our life and the victory comes into our life then the sin which ensnares us becomes slain, becomes conquered with victory over it through our own being crucified with Christ. And finally, number three, we seek out the cross. We discover the power of the cross. Number three is we carry the cross for the salvation, not only of ourselves, but, but those also who are in our lives. The goal here is not suffering, but salvation. It's salvation, right? The goal is not like when people say, that's just your cross. In other words, they're saying that's, some people understand that to be, that's how you need to suffer. No, the, the cross is for the sake of salvation. So if one means that that's their cross, that suffering may be there, but that it's intended for their salvation, that's a different story, okay? We need to discover and seek out to carry the cross for our salvation and for the salvation of others. I love the hymn. We sing it twice a year, uh, today and then during uh, Pascha week, or hymn of the cross. It says, this is he who offered himself up as an acceptable sacrifice on the cross for the salvation of our race. When Christ was crucified, he did it on our behalf. When we carry our cross, we're carrying it on the behalf of another, right? We're carrying it, yes, for my salvation, but also I'm seeking out the salvation of the entire human race. His good father smelled him at the evening watch on Golgotha. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15, we're told that we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Right here, we see that Christ is that fragrance. He's that good aroma. And yet, we are to be that good fragrance, that aroma, that sweet-smelling sacrifice that's offered up on behalf of others for the sake of the world. Not in a grandiose, you know, um, Christ, Christ, you know, we're we're not trying to have Christ uh, syndrome. No, we're doing it. We're sacrificing for others because out of love for others, we also accept to sacrifice that others might be saved. Whether it's in our families, our marriages, with our children, with our parents, with our neighbor, with the person sitting next to us or in front of us or behind us at church. We offer ourselves, we humble ourselves and sacrifice ourselves that our lives might become a fragrance of Christ. Now, I'll just close with this. When we light the incense, it lets off a beautiful aroma. But as it's letting off that beautiful fragrance or aroma that we are to become, it itself is being sacrificed. It's giving up itself. And so for us to carry the cross, what we're being told here is seek it out. Yes, discover the power of the cross in your life that you might have victory. But third, very importantly, is carry the cross for the salvation of others. Sacrifice, be willing to give of yourself for the salvation of another person. If you've discovered the power of the cross in your life, then what you're saying is, I accept that power in my life for my salvation. 
But let's carry for the sake of others, to carry and to walk with others, to, to, to go the extra mile with another. All glory be to our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who is crucified on our behalf. Amen. Let's pray.